Okay, good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on health, wellbeing and sport. Question number one, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in encouraging young people to try golf. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Uh, Club Golf is Scotland's junior golf development programme, which is one of the legacies of the Ryder Cup and introduces children to golf and supports the early development of young golfers through structured coaching. Over 390,000 children have been introduced to golf through Club Golf with the support of the Active Schools Network and primary schools across the country. The programme is delivered in primary schools at the age of nine provides a four, six set taster block of sessions where young people are provided with the basic skills needed to play golf upon completion of the programme, all are encouraged to clubs or facilities who have been involved to continue their golfing experience. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the Minister for that? As uh, the Minister knows, uh, the former First Minister made great commitment to the sport uh, and obviously there have been very considerable developments at primary level. Uh, what plans does the Scottish Government have to ensure that that transcends into secondary education and beyond? Well, I have uh, been uh, very uh, impressed by the uh, efforts of uh, Scottish Golf, which is of course the new uh, governing body following the merger of the, uh, the uh, Golf Union and uh, the uh, Ladies Association. They have uh, developed uh, their uh, Get Into Golf uh, programme, which is a, an evolution of uh, the club uh, golf programme, which seeks to uh, involve uh, a wider range of people, trying to get whole families uh, involved and uh, I uh, will be very happy to continue those discussions with them, and if there is more we can do to support that type of effort, I will be very glad to consider it. Thank you. Question number two, Myrtle Fraser. Thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government whether e-cigarettes are now available on prescription from the NHS. Minister Maureen Watt. The regulation and licensing of medicines is a matter for the UK Government and the Medicines and Regulatory Healthcare Products Agency, MHRA. I am aware that the MHRA has recently issued its first general sales license to a product which is considered to be a true e-cigarette. This means that smokers will be able to purchase this product as a licensed smoking cessation aid when the manufacturer makes it available. I understand that at this time the manufacturer has not yet released this product to market. There are no plans for this product to be routinely available on prescription in line with other forms of nicotine replacement therapy which have similar licenses. Decisions about prescribing would be a matter for individual NHS boards. I would expect any decisions to be based on the full range of evidence on the clinical risks, benefits and cost of this product compared to existing smoking cessation aids. We'd be happy to work with health boards on this once the manufacturer makes more information about this product available. Um, can, can I thank the Minister for her, her response? Oh, this is clearly a complex area, but nevertheless, I think we are aware there are clear health benefits from smokers moving away from tobacco towards e-cigarettes, and we should be doing what we can to encourage them along that path. Would the Minister take on board the fact that I think this is an area that does need more clarity? There have been press reports suggesting that prescribing of e-cigarettes will become available. There are constituents who are interested in looking at this as an option. There are also implications for the, the cost to the NHS budget should this become a widespread practice. Can I suggest the Scottish Government uh, take more of a lead in being clear as to what exactly the policy is on this going forward. Minister. Can I thank uh, the member uh, for his question? Clearly, um, we know that many people now are using e-cigarettes as a need to stop uh, smoking or to stop using uh, nicotine. Uh, we believe that it is better if people use it in conjunction with existing uh, smoking cessation products. Um, on the committee I chair, we discuss this uh, regularly, and there are still um, a lot of cigarettes, or e cigarettes are clearly still a very new product, um, and new information about them uh, is coming forward virtually on a, on a weekly basis. But I can assure the member that we are on the case. Thank you. Question number three, Joanne Lamont, has not been lodged, and an explanation has been provided. Question number four, Margaret McCullough. To ask the Scottish Government what medical staff and challenges it has identified in NHS Lanarkshire. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. <coughs> we work closely with all NHS boards to enable them to provide safe, effective and high quality care for Scotland's people at all times. That remains our absolute priority. Under this government, staffing levels in NHS Lanarkshire have increased by 13.3 per cent or over 1,200 whole time equivalent. There have also been significant increases in medical consultants, 63.2 per cent in all specialties since September 2006, including emergency medicine. 
Over the same period, consultant vacancies in Lanarkshire as a percentage of establishment have fallen by, by 4%. NHS Lanarkshire continues to fill vacancies successfully in a number of specialties uh, and has approved further investment to recruit additional medical consultants and is proactively recruiting to available vacancies. Thank you, Margaret McCulley. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. Last year, NHS Lanarkshire graded the medical staffing position in a number of departments as high risk, and they also reported concerns still about ongoing recruitment difficulties and over-reliance on locums and the future of the Health Board's approved training status. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise which services continue to be high risk, and can she give me an absolute guarantee that the Scottish Government will secure the future of approved training status for the Health Board, which is of the utmost importance to the viability of local services, medical recruitment and the career development of junior doctors? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> well, of course, uh, we are aware that, that certain services in NHS Lanarkshire are, are currently under enhanced monitoring. Uh, from the, the GMC, uh, primarily about concerns raised by trainees of poor, poor clinical supervision. It's uh, for the board working with its medical workforce and, of course, NHS Education for Scotland to identify solutions and to reassure the member we have been assured that NHS Lanarkshire is making good progress on its improvement plans. Clearly, uh, I have close oversight of that. I'm very happy to keep the local member uh, updated about that as we go forward, but I hope that's given her some level of reassurance. Thank you. Question number five, Paul Martin. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when they last met with the representatives of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Cabinet Secretary. Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Paul Martin. Uh, President Officer, I've had sight of a financial planning document provided and uh, understand prepared by uh, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And I understand from this document that it proposes the possible closure of Lightburn Hospital. Now, the Minister will be aware of the background concerning Lightburn Hospital and the uh, commitment from the now First Minister that Lightburn Hospital had a future. I wonder if the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary would confirm today that there are no plans uh, to close Lightburn Hospital. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I say to the member, I've certainly had nothing submitted to me from Greater Glasgow and Clyde about the, the future of Lightburn Hospital, but if the, the board has any plans uh, to change Lightburn Hospital, then it would obviously have to go through the procedures that we would expect them to. And obviously, if it, would, it was classified as major change, then it would come uh, to myself. But as I say, I have not had any uh, sight of uh, anything from, from Greater Glasgow and Clyde asking uh, um, to uh, be able to proceed um, with any changes to Lightburn Hospital. In terms of the budget for Greater Glasgow and Clyde, I mean, he will, the member will be aware that uh, within a very, very tight financial settlement that health boards uh, received a, a, a fair settlement, although challenging, of course. Uh, and of course, within that, £250 million has been allocated towards social care, something, of course, which the member uh, uh, called for and supported and hopefully still does. Thank you. I have three similar questions on NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So if other members wish to ask supplementaries, I'll take them at question eight. Question number six, Drew Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all boards, including Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Drew Smith. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? I'm sure when she does next meet the board, she will discuss the poor performance of the Glasgow Royal Infirmary against uh, her own A&E waiting time target, and specifically the fact that the most recent figures have revealed uh, one in five patients waiting for more than four hours. Uh, can I also offer the Cabinet Secretary the opportunity to apologise to patients who have been waiting for eight hours at the so-called immediate, immediate assessment unit at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital? Is she aware of the calls from staff there for that service to be dismantled and restructured? And what has she done to resolve the situation which last Wednesday led to a frail elderly patient being left on a trolley in a corridor and without a pillow for eight hours? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, um, I would be um, interested to um, look and uh, investigate any 
individual um, issues of concern. If they have come to me, um, I always ensure that the board investigate and that a response is given. If the member has any specific patient uh, concerns, he should raise them with me and I will respond to that. Now, uh, clearly, this uh, week and next week are two of the most challenging weeks for our A&D departments. It has always uh, been so. Uh, if you look at the performance across Scotland from the figures uh, printed, uh, produced yesterday, um, the performance, um, although challenging, is considerably better than the performance last year. Now, clearly, we want the boards to recover, and I expect them to recover, including uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, more rapidly than was the case last year. Now, I am absolutely always um, uh, keen to see progress being made, but I would hope that the member and other members would recognise the hard work and progress that has been made, whether that's in Glasgow or elsewhere. Now, he raised a specific issue about the uh, assessment unit. He will be aware, of course, that a lot of support has gone in uh, to the assessment unit. Uh, the capacity has been increased with the new ambulatory care area having been established, which is capable of seeing 20 to 30 patients a day. Uh, the board is, has also uh, created additional bed capacity across uh, the sites with winter contingency plans meeting, meeting an additional 100 uh, and four beds across the region. And, you know, while I absolutely um, don't think that that was an uh, appropriate level of care for that individual patient, uh, and we would want to see improvements made, I do hope, as I said earlier, the member would recognise that progress has been made and uh, compared to last winter, and that that would be recognised, because I think the staff deserve that. Question number seven, Nanette Mill. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of access to advanced radiotherapy. Cabinet Secretary. The radiotherapy subgroup of the National Cancer Clinical Services Group is carrying out an exercise to establish the range and types of radiotherapy treatments currently available in each of Scotland's five cancer centres. Nanette Mill. Uh, thank you. In, in the context of my supplementary, I would like to indicate that I am a co-convener of the Cross-Party Group on Cancer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Cross-Party Group and Cancer Research UK wish to highlight the benefits of radiotherapy, which experts suggest is involved in four in ten cancer cures. Many experts further advise that access to the most advanced treatments in Scotland is extremely variable, but there's no public data available to support what many people know. If such data was in the public domain, all involved in addressing the issue could give it the focus it deserves. So will the Cabinet Secretary confirm that she will use her influence to ensure this data is made available and that access to advanced radiotherapy is treated as a priority within Scottish Government and across the NHS? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think the member raises a, a, an important point and, of course, accessible and accurate data is an essential component in enabling us to shape radiotherapy services to meet the needs of the, the population. Um, earlier this year, officials conducted um, an exercise to investigate what clinical data is available to support advanced radiotherapy service planning. It was found that the, the existing uh, clinical data was incomplete and therefore um, was, was not of the quality that it needed to be. Therefore, the radiotherapy subgroup of the National Cancer Clinical Services Group is conducting um, uh, further information gathering to establish a more robust platform for the planning and sustainable delivery of advanced types of radiotherapy. And the information that will inform the forthcoming cancer plan, which will, of course, be a very important um, publication to set the, um, the future direction of travel for the next um, 10 years. So I hope that the, the member understands um, the reasons for that. And, uh, you know, I'm certainly happy to keep in contact with her as we take these matters forward. Thank you. Question number eight, Jackson Carlow. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and what issues were discussed. Uh, the ministers Secretary. and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Jackson um, in her response on the 18th of June uh, last to the Scottish Government's inquiry into the Vale of Leave in Hospital tragedy, the Cabinet Secretary undertook uh, to establish a website on which regular updates would be posted on the implementation of all 75 recommendations. She also undertook to give a report to the Health and Sport Committee at the end of November and to report back to Parliament in November as well. 
Uh, my inquiry suggests no such report has been received by the Health and Sport Committee. There has been no report back to Parliament. And more urgently, having checked the website, there is absolutely nothing updating any progress on any of the 75 recommendations, some seven months after the Cabinet Secretary undertook to do so. Can she explain why this is? Can she remedy it? And can she explain to Parliament why the follow-through on this has fallen short on an inquiry which arose from the deaths of so many people? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, to reassure the member that I certainly um, have been um, ensuring that boards, as they were expected to, have um, taken forward their plans to implement the 75 recommendations. I will absolutely, as a matter of urgency, look at the issues he raises about the website not being uh, kept up to date. It should be. I am aware that there has been... Um, continual uh, communication with the, the patient groups and I will ensure that that has continued. It is my understanding that it has because that has been a really important uh, relationship that has been built uh, with uh, those uh, patients and the, and the, 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 the families of, of those affected. Um, in terms of the report to the end of November, again, I will check that. But if that hasn't happened, then I'll certainly rectify that as a matter of urgency as soon as question time is finished. Neil Bibby. The Health Secretary will be aware that last week 237 individual patients waited more than four hours for treatment at the A&E department of the REH in Paisley. Last February, Cabinet Secretary, you sent in a crisis team and promised to fix the problem. But yet again, we are seeing only 81% of patients being seen within the waiting time target. That's not progress. Everybody knows there are not enough beds or staff at the RA. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, when are you going to provide the long-term solution and investment needed to fix the problems at the REH in Paisley? Cabinet Secretary. Well, you know, I, I think the member does the staff at the REH a great disservice. If you look at the progress that has been made at the REH over the last few months, since the figures Order. that the member highlighted, there has been huge improvement in the performance of the REH. As I said earlier, this, the two weeks, this last week and next week, are the two most challenging weeks of the year in the winter period. But I would have thought that he would recognise, for the staff's sake, not my sake, but for the sake of the staff who have put in so much effort, so much effort to improve things at the REH and all of our other A&E departments, that he would recognise the substantial progress that has been made, a huge improvement within the figures over the last few months compared to last year. I, think, I think the staff deserve a little bit more recognition of that and a little bit less criticism. Order, I think Bibby. that would go down a lot better with the staff at the RAH. Yeah, yeah. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder when uh, the Cabinet Secretary next meets uh, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, she would raise with some the issue of podiatry. I have a number of elderly constituents who have been refused simple nail cutting. One such constituent is in his 90s and can't bend to attend to his nails. Mm -hmm. Another suffers from ver vertigo. And when I asked the board to consider this case as a special one, I was told quite simplistically that vertigo does not affect foot health. Clearly, it may well do if it means the sufferer can't bend to attend to his nails. So will the Cabinet Secretary look at the guidelines for podiatry for older people and reform them, reform them so that constituents like mine can get the kind of help and attention that will allow them to remain in their own homes cut down the number of falls and just give them a better quality of life? Cabinet Secretary. Well, if the, the member um, wants to furnish me with more of the details of the particular case, I'll certainly look into that individual case. But in a general sense, obviously she is aware that the Scottish Government's uh, personal foot care guidelines were published back in September 2013, which uh, described um, the toenail cutting as personal foot care rather than podiatry care. The reason for that was to ensure that the podiatry service is, be, is, is focusing on those who have the, the greatest need. Um, so no one at risk of developing serious foot problems would be discharged from the podiatry service. And um, health boards would emphasise that people uh, who do develop more serious foot problems are able to access a podiatry service for assessment and treatment. Um, basically, the podiatry service 
has been required uh, to focus its attention on those people who need with, um, the service most, people with conditions that obviously have a very serious implication for uh, foot care. Those are the guidelines that have been in place uh, since September 2013. But as I said in my, my opening remarks, if the member wants to write to me about the specific case, then I'll certainly look into it to ensure that the guidelines are being appropriately applied. Dr Richard Simpson. Deputy Presiding Officer, can I just say that I think it's time the Cabinet Secretary stopped accusing the opposition of not being supportive to staff. <laughs> can I say on behalf of my party, and I'm sure the other opposition parties, I need a question, that Dr. we have Simpson. repeatedly said that the staff are doing a fantastic job. But I want to, to, to draw attention to today's Evening Times and ask a question on that, Deputy Presiding Officer. Rush hour gridlock causes travel misery near the new hospital. Now, this is about staff as well as patients. Staff are reporting having to take up to two hours to get out of the area at night, uh, and they are often being fined by their nursery uh, schools for failing to pick up their children on time. So if she's so concerned about staff, would she please do something about this? And at the same time, the ambulance drivers, whom we know now from our Freedom of Information inquiry, have up to 30 minutes waiting time at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and turn Dr. around, 50% more please? than any other hospital in Scotland, uh, are also reporting substantial delays at rush hour time in getting patients to and from the hospital. So the A&E waiting times do not Question, reflect these please, additional Dr. matters. Simpson. Will she deal with this traffic problem rapidly? Cabinet Secretary. On the issue of A&E waiting times, I am absolutely... Um, happy to defend and fix and rectify any issues where performance is not as it should be. But, you know, let's take the, the Christmas week of uh, this last year. A 96% performance uh, across our a &E departments in Scotland, the best performance for five years. Not a single word of praise from the opposition. Not one, not one word of praise for staff who delivered a very, very good performance. No press release. Order, please. No Order, release, Dr Simpson. No Order. Praise. And yet, as soon as there's an opportunity to have a go again at the staff in our A&E departments, then the opportunity is taken by the opposition. All I'm asking for and all the staff are asking for is a bit of balance and a bit of praise when performance is uh, delivered. Um, and, and if you don't take my word for it, you should go and speak to the way staff perceive the attacks on the A&E department. It's not about an attack on me, it's about an attack on them. Richard Simpson raised issues about uh, ambulance turnaround times. And I have been very clear with the Scottish Ambulance Service that ambulance turnaround times, particularly the Queen Elizabeth, uh, have not been good enough. They've assured me that this hasn't impacted on clinical safety and that they're actively working with ambulance service colleagues to address this. We've also allocated £400,000 this year to the ambulance service to ensure that they were better prepared for winter. And, of course, something I hope Richard Simpson would welcome, uh, we announced that there was an £11.4 million increase in funding next year, which will see around 300 extra paramedics recruited over the next five years to help improve these, uh, that situation. So, yes, the turnaround time at the, the Queen Elizabeth does need to improve. The Scottish Ambulance Service have assured me they will do so, and I would hope that that's something Richard Simpson may welcome. Question number nine, Alison Johnston. Oh, sorry, point of order, Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I wonder if you could advise what remedies open to members of this Parliament who are being wrongly accused by the Health yep. Cabinet Secretary yep. of denigrating NHS staff. I don't think I've ever heard a member in this yes, chamber of any please. party denigrating or in any way criticising members of NHS staff. We all understand and appreciate the job that they do. And having, Thank you. having undergone surgery in the last two weeks, I can tell you that from personal experience. But what members of the opposition are also trying to do is raise issues that members of staff themselves are bringing to our attention. Thank you very much, Ms so Ferguson. Can you tell me, presiding officer, what remedy are open to members of this chamber when they are being wrongly accused in this way by the Cabinet Secretary? Ms Ferguson, order, please. Order. Ms Ferguson, as you well know, it's not a point of order. However, you have made a point. I'm not responsible for 
what the Cabinet Secretary says in answer, neither am I responsible for what members ask as questions, but I would ask members if they could be more succinct or we will not get any further with this question session. Point of order, Dr Richard Sims. Dr Simpson, could you wait till I finish speaking and I'm then sorry. your microphone will be switched on. Point of order, Dr Simpson. Thank you. Is it not your duty to ensure that members treat each other with respect in this parliament? Sorry. And when, so when a member accuses other members of, of denigrating staff in the health service when they have never done so, never in 13 years in this parliament have I ever denigrated staff, and yet I'm accused by the cabinet secretary of doing so. That is not treating others with respect. Thank your you, duty, Dr. Your... Thank you, Dr. Simpson. I think all members are aware that we should treat everyone in the chamber with respect, but as I said, I am not responsible for the content of the Cabinet Secretary's answers. Did I have a point of order at the other side of the chamber? Point, point of, of order, order, Rob Gibson. Presiding officer, in the light of these points of order being taken during question time, can you add time on for those of us who actually have questions that we wish answered? Order, please. No, I'm afraid we are fixed today with the time that question time finishes for very specific reasons. So if we can move on, question number nine, Alison Johnston. Um, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it considers supporter involvement in football clubs, including ownership, can make a positive contribution to society. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The, the Scottish Government recognises the pivotal role football clubs play in communities the length and breadth of Scotland. This includes their economic impact, as well as the many wider community activities the clubs are engaged in on the back of legislation unanimously agreed by the Parliament as part of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015. We have been consulting on a range of different options to enhance support and involvement and will work with the football authorities and, of course, supporters to take forward proposals to do that. I would urge anyone who has not participated yet in a cons consultation to do so before it closes on the 15th of January. Alison Johnston. Um, I thank the Minister for his response. Does the Minister agree with anti-sectarianism campaigners like Dave Scott of Nil by Mouth that greater fan control and ownership is an exciting opportunity for the silent majority of fans who are appalled by sectarianism to find their voice in clubs and ensure a welcoming and tolerant atmosphere in our game? And secondly, if the majority of people responding to the government's consultation support a fan's right to buy, when will the government deliver it? Thank you. Minister. Well, uh, I would certainly uh, concur that we want to see as uh, positive an atmosphere in football grounds the length and breadth of Scotland as is possible. I would uh, agree that, uh, of course, uh, fo football support involvement can uh, contribute significantly uh, towards that end. I, I uh, think I was clear, uh, having uh, set out the uh, government's intended way forward at the time of the Community Empowerment uh, Bill debate, uh, President Officer, that I have no uh, preconceptions on if what type of mechanism will be taken forward, but my clear commitment is to consider uh, the responses that we garner as part of the consultation <laughs> as uh, quick as possible, and then uh, to uh, engage with uh, the football authorities and indeed football supporters quickly thereafter to determine a way forward. Thank you. Question number 10, Dave Thompson. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports and promotes involvement, sorry, uh, participation in Highland sports like Shinty and Highland Games heavy events. Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government is committed to protecting the Highland Games as a tradition enjoyed by many communities across, across Scotland. Our National Agency for Sports, Sports Scotland, also shares this commitment and recognises the Scottish Highland Games Association as the governing body of traditional Highland Games in Scotland. We are also uh, providing the Cavanagh Association with funding of up to uh, £546,000 between 2015 and 19 to support and develop Shinty. Dave Thompson. I thank the Minister for his reply, and he'll be well aware I attend many Highland Games in the summer in my constituency, and there's been a marked increase of foreign uh, heavies uh, participating and a reduction in Scottish heavies participating in these games. And I do fear if we don't up our game and provide even more support and encouragement even for young people to get involved in these heavy events, that in five or ten years' time, there won't be any Scottish heavies competing in our Highland Games. Minister. Uh, well, I suppose one of the advantages uh, that uh, Mr Thompson has uh, over me is that there will be many more uh, opportunities to attend Highland uh, Games in his constituency than there might be in uh, my own. But certainly, it uh, would concur it's important that we do what we can uh, to support the development of uh, heavy events that might uh, be part of uh, the various Highland Games across 
in the country. Uh, working in a partnership with local authorities and other Sports Scotland's Active Schools programme provides a range of extracurricular opportunities for children and young people to, to get active and stay active across a, a wide range of sports and physical activities. Heavy events like hammer throwing and, and shot putt are categorised under athletics uh, uh, in the Active Schools programme, although it can't provide a specific uh, a breakdown for specific activities within athletics. I know that the sessions for athletics took place at schools in all 32 local authorities during uh, the 2014-15 uh, academic year. And, uh, this government always stands ready to uh, consider uh, any proposals that are uh, made in uh, good faith as to how we can further uh, support and involvement in physical activity and sport across the country. Thank you. Question number 11, Stuart Maxwell. To ask the Scottish Government what action is taking to reduce the prevalence of smoking among young people. Minister Maureen Watt. Trends in Scotland continue to show that smoking among young people are the, at the lowest levels of prevalence since current surveys began in 1982. However, we must continue to take firm action to support young people to choose not to smoke if we are to achieve our vision of a smoke-free Scotland by 2034. Current activity includes continued sales and promotion restrictions, such as our display ban and standardised packaging, robust enforcement of legislation and education activities, such as our pallet of the Assist Peer Education Programme. Stuart Maxwell. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? The Minister will be aware of the Tobacco Free Schools initiative launched last year by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde in conjunction with Ash Scotland, which aims to ensure that nobody is exposed to tobacco on school grounds. However, after writing to a number of councils in my region, I was disappointed to learn that many councils appear to be unaware of the initiative. Given that two-thirds of smokers start smoking before the age of 18, what steps can the Minister take to support the rollout of tobacco-free schools across Scotland? Minister. Yeah, I thank uh, Stuart Maxwell for his continued uh, support and interest uh, in this area. Going forward, our strategy calls for NHS boards and local authorities to establish smoke-free uh, outdoor areas and it's for local authorities to decide how to do this in partnership with their local uh, populations. I know some areas have already taken action to create smoke-free campuses in schools, colleges and universities such as the Tobacco Free Schools initiative developed by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, together with Ash Scotland as the me member uh, mentioned. I fully support this work and would encourage all local authorities to consider uh, what, how to do this. The ASSIST programme, obviously the peer-led uh, schools-based programme, uh, which we are piloting in uh, Tayside, Greater Glasgow and Clyde and Lothian Health Board areas, is due to conclude in 2017 and will be evaluated and hopefully that will help with the rollout to other areas. Thank you. Question number 12, Gil Patterson, has not been lodged and an explanation has been provided. I therefore call question number 13, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government how many so-called deep end GP practices have been taken into NHS board control. Cabinet Secretary. There are currently no deep end GP practices that have been taken into NHS board control. We are, however, aware that one deep end practice in Dundee is due to come under board control in March of this year. Jenny Mara. Secretary for her answer and she has just said that plans are progressing to take the Lochy GP practice in Dundee not into control of the health board but it will come under control of the integrated joint board. This is the first practice in an area of high deprivation in Scotland for this to happen and it is the first GP practice in the whole country to come under the auspices of an integrated board. Can she please tell me who is ultimately legally responsible for delivery of this primary care service, NHS Tayside or Dundee City Council? Cabinet Secretary. Well, NHS Tayside is because um, although uh, through integration the uh, services come together, uh, the um, employment status of each of the respective groups of staff remains either the local authority or the health board. So in this case, NHS Tayside will be the employer of what I understand will be three GPs uh, at the practice and of course the other staff at the practice will also be transferred into the employment of the health board. Um, I think what's important is that uh, there is an opportunity through um, the, the Dundee Community Health Partnership um, working 
um, in an integrated fashion to uh, take on the responsibility for the operational management of the practice and looking at the, the possibility of a multidisciplinary workforce and really being able to stabilise that practice and look to the future, um, hopefully, to develop new services for the people of Lochy. I think that will be something everyone will welcome. Question 14, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to increase spending in mental health. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Despite the UK Government reducing our total budget by 4.3 per cent in relative terms between 2015 and 16 and 2019 20, the draft budget for 2016 17 confirmed that the £397 million resource consequences for health will be passed on in full, bringing the total budget for the health, wellbeing, and sport portfolio to over £13 billion for the first time last year. And its investment of £100 million to improve mental health services over the next five years. The draft budget for the coming financial year provides an additional £50 million, resulting in a total package of £150 million. On Tuesday, the First Minister announced that £54.1 million, over one third of that package, will invest over the next four years to improve access to services for people of all ages, including children and adolescents. Dennis Robertson. Uh, I thank the Minister for that comprehensive answer and welcome the increase in spending. Uh, can the Minister confirm if there is any national strategy or guidance being looked at to have um, <clears throat> a transition from services from CAMS to adult services? Minister. Well, I would uh, certainly recognise it is essential that contact uh, with health services is maintained when patients move be between services, such as uh, adolescent to adult uh, services. Uh, health boards uh, have in place uh, arrangements to ensure uh, minimisation of disruption uh, to care and to avoid loss of can contact. Uh, already, uh, what I would say to uh, Mr. Robertson is uh, we are uh, presently engaged in the early stages of the uh, new mental health strategy. I uh, welcome all suggestions as to what can be part of that. I will certainly uh, make sure Mr. Robertson's point is included as part of uh, our considerations. And if he wants to uh, contribute to that process, indeed, if any member wants to contribute to that process, uh, they'd be very welcome to do so. Question number 15, Roderick Campbell. British Government, what progress is being made on the construction of the new intensive psychiatric care unit at Strathedon Hospital? Minister, Jimmy Hepburn. Uh, construction of the £4.5 million new intensive psychiatric care unit on the Strathedon Hospital site is progressing well and is currently expected to be completed within budget by the 25th of April 2016. Lord Campbell. I um, thank the Minister for that answer and indeed his comprehensive answer to the previous question of Dennis Robertson. Um, I recognise that the new IPC unit will help provide essential care to those who need it most when it opens. But is the Minister able to add uh, any further information as to uh, facilities for children and young people, particularly in Fife, uh, as a result of the increase promised in the budget? Minister. It, well, of course, we uh, already have uh, made significant commitments for uh, children and young people through a mental health service. We have the, the CAMS heat uh, standard to, to improve access to treatment for uh, children and adolescents. Uh, uh, indeed, in the latest published figures, 27 per cent more uh, people were seen by CAMS in the comparable period for uh, 2014. I recognise uh, more uh, needs to be done. Yesterday's announcement uh, of uh, 54.1 million investment from our total funding package of uh, 150 million in mental health services over five years will improve uh, access to psychological therapies for all ages, including children and adolescent mental health services, and that will obviously include people in the NHS Fife area. Question 16, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you, officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has considered how it could make it easier for inpatients to participate in NH NHS consultations. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robertson. Listening and learning from patients is vital to improving health care quality and has always been a priority for this Government, our Patients' Rights Act of 2011 gives all patients the right to participate and is set out in our patient charter. We want to build on that and continue to make it easier for the voices of patients to be heard. To that end, recent developments include patient opinion, the independent websites through which people can share their experiences directly, our voice, which will strengthen participation systems and practice. And of course, we are currently in the middle of the national conversation, which I launched in August, through which we have already engaged over 10,000 people uh, on the future of our health and social care services and what really matters to them. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Consultations can sometimes feel like a way to kick an issue into the long grass. So what help has the Scottish Government offered to NHS boards to make consultations quicker without compromising their response rate? Cabinet Secretary. 
Oh, I, I think the member raises a, a, a fair point, and guidance, uh, extensive guidance, has been uh, given to boards. And of course, the involvement of the Scottish Health Council uh, should help boards in making sure that when they consult uh, on services within their area, they do so in a way that is of quality uh, and is genuine. Part genuinely participative. Now, if there are uh, further changes that we can make to improve that, then I'm certainly happy to hear uh, uh, those proposals uh, through the, the national conversation or uh, directly to myself if the member wants to write to me. Thank you. That ends uh, question time. The next item of business this afternoon is the